What's your favorite room? Favorite room. Lounge. Your two or three? Two or seven. Yeah. Yeah. Well, isn't isn't Garrick? Where where aren't you guys at eight a.m.? Some happy you are with Garrick and what? Is that two o three? It's over there. You just came across the hall. I think so. So I don't think Blount is a good one. Um, there's one in Beatty that we used last summer, 401. Yeah, it's bigger. You like that one? Yeah. Okay, maybe we'll try for that. And then you can just go to lunch. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Okay, everyone, listen up. She's going to ask us about the email. Okay. I didn't understand. You're Rachel? No, not Jessica. Jessica. Okay, Jessica, what's your question? Um, so I got two emails. I didn't understand them. I apologize. Sometimes, as good as we are and as hard as we try, sometimes the first engagement with the students in a course is an utter and complete error. I apologize, that was wrong. Um, the goal uh, has always been, and we've done this successfully in the past, but we failed miserably last year, and we failed ever so slightly this year. The goal is to get the class to meet uh, for a, a shared lecture on Thursdays at 10 a.m. And then give you five days to recover, to take stock, to make sense of the lecture, and to choose something around that topic to bring to the discussion in smaller groups on Tuesday. So we're looking for a long period of time and we bring that to class on Tuesday in, for smaller discussions. Does that make sense? You did it in history, right? Remember history theory two? How many of you, raise your hand if you did not take history theory two at Wentworth Institute of Technology? Everyone took that. Everyone took that course. Okay, great. Wait, what? Sorry, yeah, that was boring. That uh, no, I didn't. You didn't take, you didn't take it. it. Okay. Did everyone else take it? And he didn't take it. Yeah. You'd remember him, right? <laughs> Do you know who this guy is? Yes. <laughs> he just wasn't in my history. Theory and he, he showed up. <laughs> somewhere else. 
Okay. Is it okay with you guys? Okay. Yes. First week is okay. Hold on. Hold on. So, um, if it was a meeting, we wouldn't have time for lunch. We have barely enough time to like just get this. Yeah. There's a discussion going on about how to deal with the twelve o'clock, the ten o'clock class, and the twelve o'clock class. And there's a long tradition in history at Wentworth to say studio starts at 12, but 12.30 is fine. But I'm, I don't want to speak for them, but that's what I expect them to say. Uh, um, today, might, might, they might be uh, disappointed if you show up at 12.30 today because they haven't told you that yet, right? So let's try to wrap things up here uh, before 12, before 11.50, and so we can ease our way into this very challenging semester, right? Because you've heard about comprehensive studio, right? Some of you have taken comprehensive before, and you're taking it again, right? No? No? Wow. Congratulations. That's great. Um, yeah, it's a hard studio course. It's demanding. And guess what else is, is very demanding? This course is very demanding. So there's a lot of work that happens between Thursday and Tuesday. And one of the things I will be asking you is when is the best deadline for us to agree to for the, the work you're going to be working with on Tuesday? In previous years, uh, your, your predecessors have said, uh, we don't want it due Tuesday morning, right? It has to be due before Tuesday. We meet on Tuesday so that you're ready to engage each other productively. It needs to be done before we meet, but Tuesday morning is not a good deadline. Monday night might be a good deadline, but you have studio on Monday. So maybe that's not a good deadline. Sunday is the Lord's Day, day of rest, right? And no, it's not the Lord's Day. It's your comprehensive studio instructors make it very clear. That's, that's when they're doing the work for Monday, right? I don't, I don't care what they say, frankly. To hell with them, my good friends and colleagues. <laughs> but if you say you want your deadline Sunday, then we can make that work. And they'll understand. If you say no, 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 as the last year's group, they said Saturday. And they said Saturday at midnight. And I said, no, Saturday at midnight. Please, Saturday at 6 p.m. Because, you know, life. Right, so you'll be thinking about this, but the focus of the course is not this lecture thing we do on Tuesday. The lecture thing, I mean, the lecture thing we do on Thursday. The lecture thing we do on Thursday, as we intended it to be in history theory two, is the foundation for the real learning. The real learning is when you guys go out into the world, you find something that interests you, you engage it productively using these mad skills of architects, and you bring it into a discussion with your colleagues on Thursday. And we try to figure out what's going on and what to do about it. This is not, well, we'll get into this. This is not a normal, class that was taught in the 20th century. This is a new kind of class. Okay, we're hitting the reset button. And we're just gonna do things differently. Not just differently, in many ways, we're gonna do things the opposite. This is opposite day. Every time we show up here, it's opposite day. We're gonna do it the opposite way we used to do it. Okay. So um, that's not the normal way I start my courses. Here's how I start my courses. 
Welcome to Architecture 3700, I think. Uh, my name is Robert Cowherd. You can call me Robert. And I am number four. I'm not the most important source of understanding. On a good day, I'm the fourth most important source of understanding. Way down the list. You've heard me say this. Does this ring a bell? Did I teach you last spring or two springs ago? You've never had me as a professor? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, then this is even more important. And it's important to explain this because it, you're architects, right? You look at the room. How is this? What's the architecture of this room? What is the structure of this room? What is the larger system within which this structure that we're engaged with right now exists? And how does the design of this room and what we're doing right now reflect the larger system and the larger culture? It's very confusing for me to say I'm number four because look at the way the seats are. Look at the way the chairs are. You're facing me. You're facing this washed out screen that you can probably barely see, right? It looks from any outside observer, it looks and feels as if I'm the most important person in your lives for this hour and 50 minutes. But it's not, don't be fooled. Ideally, I'm the fourth most important source of understanding. So I'm number four. The third most important source of understanding, and you probably already know this because you're, you're juniors, right? So because you're juniors, you already know that you're gonna learn more from each other than you are from your instructors, right? Is that true? Yeah. Pretty much, right? Uh, we don't know why. We, we stopped apologizing for that long ago. In a way, we embrace it. We set up the studio environment to make sure that that happens. We're happy that we're back on campus. We're happy that uh, the Institute has provided this amazing machine for producing brilliant architects. It's called the studio. Thank you, Institute. And uh, this is the greatest. Uh, most powerful engine of producing creative individual problem solvers that we've ever found out, we've ever discovered. And that's why business schools and engineering schools and every you know fill in the blank schools are shifting to a studio model. That's why the Stanford Business School renamed their school the D School, the design school, because studio is the most powerful problem solving thing that humans have ever come up with. So congratulations. We're embracing that. Your classmates are number three. They're the third most important source of understanding in your lives. So thank you, Give thank, thank each other, thank yourselves, and here we go. It's getting warmer and warmer in this room every second. Do you notice that? Yeah. Maybe we can turn on that a uh, steampunk age box in the window and apologize for the noise. <laughs> okay. So that's number four, and that's number three. As you might guess, there's a number two coming up. What's the second most important source of understanding? And there's a number one coming up. What's the number one source of understanding? That might be easier. The ability of Wow, that's really close. Did you hear? Inspirations. Inspirations. Iterations. 
I'm going to put that in number two iterations, but say that again. Your past experiences, so where you Your past experiences and where you come from. Uh, yes. So the, the most important source of understanding is the world itself and your journey through the world, your experience in the world. Back when I was in architecture school, the first job of the instructors was to flatten us down and help us understand that we are nothing and we are nobody and we have no skill, no knowledge. We might have some God-given talent. They'll let us know uh, by kicking out people who don't have God-given talent and advancing those who do. That was the system, the larger system and culture of architectural education. It didn't work out so well. We're going to do the opposite of what they did. So the number one source of understanding is the world itself. You have access to it. People who are not paying a million dollars uh, for an education have access to it, um, which brings us to number two. Number two are the tools of architecture. The tools of architecture are the second most important source of understanding. The world itself is the first most important uh, source of understanding, uh, but it's sometimes a bit overwhelming and complicated. We, uh, so if you don't have an architectural background or a design training, a design education, you look at, you work, you go through the world and it's very confusing, it's hard to figure out and you do the best you can. But when you have a design education, you have some skills and you have some tools and you have some methods for making sense of the world and understanding it in a way that other people don't have access. Your parents, unless they're designers, don't have access to this understanding of the world that you're accessing. So, uh, if, uh, so your tools that you're learning in architecture school are what we're going to use to build on the foundation established on Thursdays to bring the skills and tools of architecture to bear on the world that we're experiencing out there. And then we bring it to class on Tuesday. We try to make sense of what's going on. And based on the sense of how the world is working, what to do to make it better. That's what design does. That's the superpower of designers. That's why people hire architects. That's what will get you promoted. It's what will get you those student loans paid off. And it's what will help you say 25 years from now, wow, that was the best investment I ever made. Right? Because uh, you're all in college, congratulations. You know, that's great. It's not a guarantee that things are going to go well in life. Some people go to college, they spend the best four or five years of their lives sitting in horrible classrooms like this one, uh, working really hard. And either they themselves or their families or somebody is paying right now. What's this? What's the list price for a four-year education? At one point? Have you ever figured that out? What is it? How much is tuition? What is it? I think probably about three hundred. Three hundred dollars. That's three hundred thousand dollars. Is it three hundred thousand dollars in total? Is that for four years or five years? I think it's four. And you live in dorms. How many of you? The food plan, the dorms, the books, the computers. Oh, well, we gave you computers, right? We paid for them. No. It's about $55,000. Oh. It cost. Not semester, three years. 
So what should we call it? Quarter million? Yeah. Okay, let's call it quarter million. <laughs> Okay, what could you do with a quarter million dollars? My house. <laughs> okay, let's bring it back. So I think you get the idea. Trying I'm trying to focus your attention on things that matter profoundly to you personally as you move through this career. And that is connected to what matters profoundly to the world as you move through your careers. Uh, I have another question for you, and this one's... Um, more optimistic it's a more positive question um when what what's the year that you will kind of hit your peak leadership position in architecture whether, whether it's in architecture or whatever when are you going to be the boss when are you going to be at the peak of your career trajectory how many 40 years? So we have someone said six when you're sixty, someone said when you're forty or fifty. Sixty, so we should say fifty. Yeah. So what year is yeah. that? Yeah. Twenty fifty. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's convenient. It's a very similar number. So imagine that it's the year twenty fifty. Okay, Are you with me? It's the year twenty fifty. Your student loans are paid off by them or forgiven. No chance. No, they could be forgiven by them. That's the move. That's where we're going. <laughs> or you could die for let's assume let's assume that you make it that far. Okay. What now? It's the year 2050. What do you wish? What do you wish you had learned back in architecture school? Wait, what was that? Yeah, but at this point, you're going to be at this point, you need to get so we're going to write it down. We're going to make a list and we're going to write it down. Okay. Okay, here we are. Let's let's gather some things that you wish you had learned back in the 20s. Things you wish you had learned in school, and specifically things you had learned about the history of how cities work and how we got to where we are. Right. So it's 2015. What do you wish you had learned 27 years ago? When it was 2023. How to work better interdisciplinary. Okay. What else? You wish you had learned 
In terms of saying why they planned them. Why? Why they planned them, or why? Why it was formed as it was. Why it happened the way it was. Because those are two great things. We make plans, and then things happen. So, how? Maybe how? How did we get here? Okay. How did cities get this way? And what else do you wish you had learned back in 2023? Yeah. I guess to piggyback to what she said, kind of like the origin of like the materials of like some of the stuff that we think is like, you know, like American and stuff, like where was it? Where did, yes, source. Yeah, we're asking that question. Where did this stuff come from? Was it mined with child labor in Africa? Or did it release methane into the atmosphere? Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. I wish I wish I had learned that in architecture school so I could make it part of my practice. Uh, yeah, I think I've lost track of what I was going to say. Okay. Yes. How to work internationally. So some of these things are skills. These are target questions. These are your, this is your opportunity to challenge me to deliver something that you find valuable. I feel like it kind of relates to what you said. You're like learning about cultural. Um, aspects that um, that we don't have here, and how do we match those needs? How do different cultures impact cities? Essentially, trying to respond more efficiently. Uh, in extreme situations like natural disasters or biological disasters like COVID. How do we respond to extreme disaster scenarios? Yeah. And it turns out that disasters help us understand what to do when there's no disaster. That's a, a very good question. How to respond. Anything else? That's all you want to know? So far, it's pretty easy. You take it easy on it. This is your chance. How many, how often do you get a chance to design the curriculum? An AI thesis. Wow. <laughs> now, now we're getting harder questions. We're just warming up now with some hard questions. Yeah. When is a city too far gone? What are you going to need? This is your chance. You don't want to be sitting there in the conference room and a question is raised and everyone turns and looks straight at you and you're like a deer caught in the headlights. Why are they looking at me? Oh, that's right. I'm the architect. <laughs> I'm the one who went to Wentworth and got a master's. But I'm incredible. <laughs> Steve Punk Box is really working. Maybe turn it down. No, it's okay. Feels good. Okay. All right. Try a more question. Goosebumps. Okay. How do different how to build for different abilities? How to build for difference. Yeah. 
parts of it. But the impact of capitalism and how it's uh, affected your psychological system. Capitalism? We're architects. We're supposed <laughs> to talk about capitalism? <laughs> <laughs> Why would architects talk about capitalism? Because it's, it's like part of the market. Well, it's part of the market. Technology and capitalism. <laughs> technology, I get. There's a whole smart technology concentration. But is it okay to talk about capitalism? Yeah. Are you guys okay with that? Yeah. Okay. 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 Capitalism. Capitalism it is. Okay. Capitalism it is. We're going to talk about capitalism. I guess you looked at the syllabus. What else are we going to? What else should we talk about? Yeah. Space. Is there a limit to design? Maybe. You got this. <laughs> it used to be when I was in the in this class, architecture was very carefully defined. There was architecture and it had museums in it and wealthy people's houses. And then there was the rest of the world. And I was told point blank, you can either solve problems of the world or you can do good architecture. Make your choice. You can't do both. Those days are so long gone, it sounds ridiculous for me to say this. I hope you haven't heard anyone say that ever. I hope this is the first time you've ever heard this idea. Okay. How do we design to last? Yeah. Anything else? Oh, go ahead. Uh, is architecture beyond the planet Earth possible? Design to what do you want to change? Like to have it be able to, like, um, that building we learned about is the one that they always take down and rebuild. Like, how do we design? Oh, they say shine. Right. So you took history theory too. Didn't I give, did I give the final lecture? You did for our year. What was, was your year different than Mary? Yeah, I So you've never seen me before? I didn't give the final lecture in history. You probably see it. Here I am thinking that you're gonna remember the content of that lecture and you don't even remember we, we've seen you before. You've seen me before. Yeah, I definitely gave us lectures, but I don't remember some of the last one. Okay. I've never seen you in person. Okay. Yeah, oh, we were on Zoom. Yeah, that also might be the app. Oh, that's fair. <laughs> I'm so glad to meet you in person. Okay. So that's it? That's all? You're good? Okay. If you think of something else, you got to say it and say you and so you will raise your hand and you'll say remember that first day you asked us what we needed to know to to for that moment of truth in 2050 i thought of something else so moment of truth in 2050 we need to learn this just say it when you think of it okay metaverse, metaverse the architecture of the metaverse Okay, you're, you're still thinking? So keep that question floating. It's kind of important. 
there's actually nothing more important. Some people go to college, they pay a quarter of a million dollars, they spend the best four or five years of their lives. And then 10, 15, 20 years out, they say, why did I do that? I always wanted to be a rock and roll drummer. I should have just done that, right? That was the worst investment I ever made. Uh, this is on brand for Wentworth. We say this is, what do we call it? It's a return on investment. Like that's why we're so, that's why we're booming. That's why we have like 200 freshmen coming in this September, 200. We're gonna, we're gonna move and, and take over the whole complex here. That's why it's because we help build, we prepare you for successful careers. That is a central driving idea of this course. So the reason we do what we're doing in this course, it's because this course is built on what we do in the thesis program. I haven't been teaching this. Well, I guess I haven't teaching. I haven't been teaching the history theory two course a lot because I've been spending so much time in the thesis program. The reason what we do what we do in the thesis program is because we know what it's like to practice architecture in the 21st century. And so to prepare students for a successful practice, we teach the thesis program in a very specific focused way. And we see who is successful in the thesis program. And we see what it takes to succeed in the thesis program. And so we teach the concentrations in a very specific way so that you will be ready for success in the thesis program and your career. And now we teach history theory too, the same way to prepare you for this class, to prepare you for uh, the thesis, to prepare you for success in your career. And we have a long, a happy track record of people getting a lot out of this class, bringing it to the thesis program, getting a lot out of the thesis program, and bringing that to practice. Okay. Do you have any questions about this big idea of the course? Okay. So, As I said, the main, the main method that we use, uh, the main set of methods are organized in a very specific way. Every week, as you see in the syllabus, everyone has a syllabus? If you look at the uh, page five, what you see, oh, first of all, we had a sketch writing due at 6 a.m. according to this. Don't worry about it. I have one more. <clears throat> so um, the, the rhythm of the class, is let's start with um, the end of the class on Thursday. You just had a wonderful, enriching experience. Pretend it's next Thursday. You just had a wonderful, thought-provoking uh, discussion with your classmates, driven by your classmates, dominated by your classmates. And you're looking forward to next Tuesday's lecture, the next topic. So. Uh, I mean, next Thursday, let's see, I'm going to get this right. It's Tuesday. You just had a very successful discussion with your classmates, and you're looking forward to next Thursday right, to do for some more for the next topic. So Thursday comes along, but before Thursday comes along, you read something. You have a reading every week that you need to engage prior to the lecture. And this is to get you ready for the content that's coming at you in the lecture. 
Uh, in the old way we did things, we split you up as unique individuals. Every single one of you would read the whole thing from start to finish. Every single one of you would paraphrase and respond to the key points. And every single one of you would submit some writing based on the reading before getting to lecture to make sure that you do the reading. But we don't do things the way we used to do it. We are, nobody does things in isolation anymore. Everything is collaborative. Or it's a mixture of individual and collaborative work. So what we want you to do is to uh, read the reading quickly. And this is a quick reading to identify what is in there. And here's the, another thing that's different. We want you uh, to identify the content of the reading that sparks your interest. And we want you to identify the things in the reading that you don't find useful. We don't want you to be passive cogs in the machine. We want you to exercise your personal agency. That's a word we're gonna use a lot. You are the agents of your own path to this world. That includes how you engage this lecture, how you engage the readings, how you engage the analysis assignment. It's your job to get what you can out of this education. We're, we do the best we can, but you cannot trust us. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Schools do the best we can. One that does an excellent job. But no, no matter how good the school is, no matter how good the, the instructors are, it's not good enough. Quarter million dollars, four or five best years of my life, I'm sorry, this is not acceptable. This is not good enough. If you're not gonna give me the education I need, I guess I have to take things into my own hands. Sorry, but that's the way education has always been. You notice that? Schools do the best they can, but it's not good enough. So you do, you, you grab anything selfishly, you grab everything you can get from the schooling and the instructors, and then you, you take off of it and you go further. You got to do a lot of work on your own to justify the sacrifice, the time, the money, and what's at stake here. What's at stake personal? What's at stake professionally? What's at stake for the world? So we, in this new reset educational approach, this new process of education, we acknowledge the fact that we're number, I'm number four. You can't trust me to give you what you need. I do the best I can. I put it out there and say, why don't you read this? But when you read it, before you start reading this thing that you're supposed to read for uh, next Thursday, right? You don't have it yet, but on Brightspace, there's going to be a reading. And when you pick it up, you should start off. And you, no one has ever told you this before, I bet. But you should be a little pissed off. Has anyone ever told you that? You should be a little annoyed, a little angry. It's a productive level of, uh, of pissed offness. You should be saying, why am I even taking this class? Right? You in touch with that? Why are we taking this class? What's the point of all of this? Right? You feel that? Um, is it okay if you don't take this class? No. You still have to take it. We haven't changed that. But we want you to, we want to take advantage of the fact that it's an awkward arrangement. You need to identify what in this reading is going to make you a better architect, make you happier, make you a more successful professional actually do something that you feel good about in the world. So when you pick it up, 
you're not on the beach reading a novel. You don't start with the first sentence and read all the way through as if, as if you can trust us. You cannot trust us. You have to be a critical free agent. You have to look at this and say, first of all, get in touch with your inner like pissed offness. Say, ah, I don't have time for this. I got a friendship studio, right? So then you read it as if you don't have all the time in the world because you don't have all the time in the world. This is one of the secret methods for success. How, how do I succeed as professional? Successful professionals do not read the whole thing. Successful professionals uh, look at it, okay, this is, I can already tell this is what's going on. Maybe I do read the first paragraph just to get a sense. But then I look down and I look for things that are bold. I look for key words, key sentences, and I get a sense of what, what the reading is offering me. And then I go in strategically to those parts of the reading that actually hold something of value to me. And so that's how we want you to read. We call that uh, active reading. It's one of the most important skills that any college student graduates with. And we're going to really master the skill. And because we're going to practice something we call sketch writing. Sketch writing is something you're going to be doing uh, between next Tuesday and Thursday. So maybe we'll make it part of the discussion on Tuesday. But uh, it's, it's going to show up. The readings are going to show up in Brightspace. And a description of how to do sketch writing is going to show up. You're going to engage the reading. You're going to say, I want, you're going to, and then you're going to do a group sketch writing. We've only done this one year before, but we're going to try it. You're going to do, you're not going to be responsible. You do have to read the whole thing, but not like, uh, not like you're on the beach reading the novel. You're gonna strategically engage the reading. You're gonna have a sense of everything that's in it, but you're gonna go in deep where it makes sense to you to go deep. And then you're gonna collectively produce a piece of sketch writing in a Google doc together. Crazy? Crazy good? Okay. So we're gonna be talking about that next Tuesday. That's just to get you ready for the lecture. Then there's the lecture, and we're going to do some lecture stuff here. And uh, then that by the end of the lecture, you should say, okay, you're going to be like bloodhounds every week. You're going to get a sense of what matters to you, what matters to the world, and you're going to then you have to go out and find an example that can help us understand how the world works and what to do about it. And that's the focus of discussions every Tuesday. Question. Yes, it's gonna be very similar to drawing and writing, but it's cities. We don't have time to draw a city. What do we do if we don't have time to do all this drawing stuff? What? Get it from like the internet or something. We're going to use photography. We're going to use photographs. And we're going to use Photoshop. You're good with Photoshop. You're fast with Photoshop. You're precise with Photoshop. Do you know about the magnet tools and the auto select? You're going to be pretty soon. So uh, I'll show you some examples of previous work where you find an oblique aerial perspective about four stories up, looking at a piece of architecture in the foreground set in an urban context in the background we're going to figure it out. We're going to figure out what's going on. Why is it we're doing what it's doing? How is it doing what? How is the architecture doing what it's doing? And um, 
and then we're going to abstract some principles out of those examples. So the outcome at the end of every week on Tuesday is a set of abstract principles that we believe can help generate better design and address some of the problems in the world. Okay. okay. So I'm number four. I can I can set up the structure. I can present the groundwork. I can select the readings, but where we go in this course is really up to you. And we can cover all of these things, except for the metaverse. I'm not sure if we're gonna to get to that. Um, but we're gonna to get to this other stuff, okay? So I have some slides here and I should probably show them to you to make sure I'm not forgetting anything in my, my improv approach to teaching. Oh, they made it perfectly impossible. I guess I can turn that. Mm. Is that, can you see it better? That's right. Is that better? You're not gonna fall asleep? No guarantees, right? Okay. Um, it's cold. No, no. Okay. So we did this. I sometimes I do this with slides, but just so you have the visual reinforcement, your teachers are important. They're number four. Your colleagues are more important. The tools of architecture give us special access to an understanding of the world that nobody else has. And the world is the ultimate source of understanding. It will set you straight by knocking you down. If you're getting it wrong, the world will let you know by punishing us. Unlike when I was a junior, we now say that your life experience makes you a better person. We don't say forget about who you are. We say, we need you to bring to class every day your expertise because you are the world's foremost expert on your own life experience. We cannot do this unless you bring your expertise of your life experience to what we do, to design every day. So that's the opposite of what we used to do. We acknowledge and embrace that each of you are different. Sometimes we wish you were more different. Uh, yeah. So there are humbling truths. Yeah. That's crazy. You didn't arrange that? I don't, I don't even know. Wow. Okay. Okay. So one, some of the reasons why we need to take this approach is because the world is broken. The first topic here is the Anthropocene. Um, as a representative from your parents' generation, let me say, if they haven't said it yet, um, oops, uh, sorry, no one has ever inherited more of a colossal mess than your generation. Sorry. Please do not do what we did. We have to push the reset button. We have to do education different. We have to do design practice different. We have to do everything different. Because if you just, if we taught you how to do what we did uh, very well, we're just making it worse. So we got to push the reset button and we got to do things different. Your education has to be different. When I first took this class, we started with, we started from the dawn of time and we moved forward. The Big Bang, four point something billion years ago. And then humans showed up and we started leaving remnants of their cities and so on forward through time. This is Chakal Huyok in Turkey. And 
the first week we talk about ancient cities and you do readings about ancient cities. And you would know with absolute certainty that this is the most useless use of my time and the quarter million dollars possibly ever conceived. Is, are there things to learn from Chatal Hoyo? Yes, there are. But if we're starting with Chatal Hoyo, if I gave you a lecture on Chatal Hoyo, I guarantee you, and we've done scientific testing, not in this classroom, but in previous classrooms, that there is a physiological, a direct and immediate physiological response. It goes something like this. <sighs> Getting all comfy. Maybe I have a baseball cap. I'm sitting in the back. And, and he's gone. I, that is not crazy. Your natural response to check out and get all passive, that's built, that's baked into the system. This is. I wasn't taught how to get a job, but I can remember dissecting a frog. I wasn't taught how to pay tax. Okay. It's a brilliant, <laughs> it's a brilliant critique of education. I don't have the sound right. It's in the slideshow. You can check it out. It's all shared on Brightspace. Oh, here's another thing. Who's, who's good at, is it okay if we use WhatsApp? Sure. I used to ask, what's your favorite social media thing? And it was all over the place. And then after discussion, the foreign students, the international students would say, what's up? And so we've always done what's up. There is an urbanism group chat on what's up. It is actually a part of this course for you to be a member of that group chat. Who's going to set up? Who's going to get everyone's? Who's going to do that? Who's going to be the administrator for the WhatsApp group chat? And you can nominate someone. Oh, thank you. What's your name? Angelise. Thank you. Thank you, Angelise. So the fundamental question, one of the fundamental questions has to do with how cities got this like this, how did cities get like this, and how do they influence these structural relationships that operate within human societies? How does it not just, how is architecture not just a product of capitalism, but it's also a reinforcer, a reproduction, a machine that reproduces the arrangements and relationships of capitalism. That's, that's a really important thing for us to engage with here. And we, we're gonna look at things outside of the US context because we have so much to learn. We used to say, oh, that'll never happen here. And yet, it's happening. Just look around. This is happening in the United States. So we talked about sketch writing. The same skills you use in, in uh, engaging the reading are useful skills for engaging the lecture content. So uh, some of you take notes. Some of you treat lectures as entertaining. You know. If I don't remember it, then it must not be important kind of approach. I've tried that and it really helped me go the other way. And I actually invented some software for taking notes in class and uh, dozens of people were using it and it's been very useful 
for me to take notes. So I strongly encourage you to use your sketch writing skills to engage this class, write things down that strikes you as important, but also capture what is happening to you. What are you thinking of? What connections are you making to the content of the lecture with other things that you know about? Like some of you understand redlining as a thing. And when I say something like capitalism reproduces the arrangements of capitalism, uh, in the built environment, you should make, you know, you might make the connection. Oh yeah, uh, where I was growing up, uh, the property tax was really high and uh, that was what supported good schools. And it was different in the town next door where property taxes were low, property values were low and the schools were not as good, right? That is part of what architecture does. So let's get into the content. You will recall, I boldly assert, that they, they ignited the industrial revolution. Uh, the lecture, the last, it was really the second to last lecture uh, from History Theory 2, Lecture 12, where that guy came on Zoom and he showed you this. Um, the global population is a big structural part of the whole thing, right? So what is the global population? This says 1 billion. Is that the population? I think it just like went over 8 billion. Yes, thank you. In 1800, it hit 1 billion. <laughs> Starting in 10,000 BC, we know more or less how many humans there were. Not, not many compared to today for a long time. Many. Big uptick, and then starting around 1000, really took off, right? But we can't, we're gonna have to be because, because of what happens next, we're gonna compress, we're gonna compress the lower part of the scale and stretch this out so we can see how the population progresses. So, this is the same graph as that one, we're just compressing it. Uh, compressing the lower years so we can stretch up the more recent years and really see what's going on. It is architecture. Okay. The next billion, even though it took thousands of years to get to 1 billion, we hit the second billion only about 130 years later. Are you scared yet? The next billion, took less than that around the time your parents were born, I think. When were your parents born? I'm, I'm getting older. Okay, around the time your grandparents were born, three billion. And then hold on, strap in, here we go, gabing. Gabing, 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 gabing. Are you scared yet? What's going on here? No wonder the world is dying, right? Is what we want to say. It has nothing to do, what we want to say is it has nothing to do with architecture. It's the population dummy, right? Is that true? Is it the population? If it's not the population, what is it? Population is one part of the equation. What's the other part? Sure, if we had a lower population, maybe things would not be so out of hand. But what, you, what are you gonna do? If you're like one of our students, you can, do a thesis project on women and girls' education in Africa and then go build it. And that is the one thing you can do as an architect to have an impact on population. It turns out the only effective way to engage the question of population is through women and girls' education. Why? Reproductive rights, 
If women and girls are educated, if women and girls have control over their own bodies, then the population problem goes away. And the only place we care about at this point is Africa. So let's all go. No, because there's another component that we all are part of. What is it? It's consumption. What is the impact per person? Right now, it's not the 8 billion that are a problem. It's the 300 million that are the problem. And which 300 million are we talking about here? The United States. The United States of America contributed one quarter of the carbon content of the atmosphere. And we've set up a system where everyone in the world wants to be like the United States. Everyone wants a car. Everyone wants a suburban house. Everyone wants uh, air conditioning for glass skyscrapers. It's architecture and it's the design of the built environment and it's food. Don't forget food. It's also the food. But two of those three things is architecture, the shape of our cities and the shape and how our buildings are built. So uh, here we are in 2050. Well, that's convenient. That's your peak career year. What's happening? What's happening to the curve? Do you see it? It's starting ever so subtly, right? But who knows? Maybe, maybe it's just going to head straight off like that, right? Do you guys know how this ends? How does this end? We do know. Victory is ours. The population boom levels out around 2100. Oh, wait, we got this wrong. Sorry, this is the old prediction. We thought we had a control on women and girls' education. I first made this graph in uh, 2002. And since then, we've got new info. So we kind of missed, we missed the 10 billion mark. Sorry about that. Another mistake. Ask your parents. Your parents should be apologizing to you as well. And your grandparents. We're now hitting, it's more like 11 billion around 2100. So your entire careers, you're going to hear people say, well, in 15 years, the human population is going to be 9, 9 billion. Or in 25 years, the human population is going to be, or the population of Boston, or the population of Bangladesh, or, or Jakarta. It's all an annoying distraction. The world we are designing for, in when we go into the studio and do our comprehensive design, the world we are designing for is the world of 11 billion. This is true for your entire careers. You are designing for an 11 billion person world. And get used to helping your colleagues embrace that. It's 11 billion. There's nothing we can do if we're not going to Africa to work on women and girls education or unless the disempowerment of women comes full force in the United States, maybe we can have some impact locally on that front, but let's hope we don't need to. Um, this is what it looks like back at the old scale. And um, what we picture long-term is, so this is a, a graph of human history. We were a world of people. Then something happened. And the world we are designing for is the long tail of 11 billion people. That's just the way it's going to work. There's nothing we can do very much to impact it one way or the other. 
this is the reality. So that shifts our focus to the other part of the equation. 11 billion people times the per capita impact. Earth can either support that equation or we need two Earths or three Earths or if, if the 11 billion live the way we do in the United States, I think it's something like six Earths, right? If everyone, uh, if the 11 billion lives the, lives the way they do in India, uh, we can get by with 23 Earths. So this is the big variable. 11 billion is, is a constant for those of you who are math geeks. Sorry. And this is the variable. What is the per person impact? This is what architects do. Architects design the per person impact. And we, we bring the per person impact down and we make it look wonderful. Yes. How did you raise awareness in countries that have social media? Name a country that doesn't have social media. For example, like the African continent. The African continent has social media. Uh, in, in, a, in a sense that doesn't get uh, influenced by the government. What's in because the continent can be, for example, I know Thailand is different. So different the, the content that they have on Facebook. Wait, this is important. This is key. The content they have on Facebook in Thailand is is basically controlled uh, by government. Controlled by government right. And what is the government saying to the people of Thailand that they should be doing? Oh, doing all the wrong stuff. Uh, doing all the wrong stuff. That we see as bad. That we see as bad. Yeah. We know it's bad because we did it. Right. Thailand, uh, so Bangkok, how's the traffic in Bangkok? Oh, terrible. Terrible. Why? Because there is no rule and regulation. Well, it's frantic, but a uh, bigger question is how did Bangkok become one of the most trafficked clogged cities in the world, it's because after World War II, the US uh, was going, went to Japan and said, okay, Japan, let's rebuild your country so you can join the democratic trading partners of the, partners of the world and not go communist. Like that was the goal after World War II. So we said, hey, we have this beautiful interstate highway system that we just finished in the United States, or we're finishing in the United States, we'll give you that. And Japan said, oh, thank you very much, but no thank you. You'll look at our country, it's got mountains and sacred forests and very big cities. We don't want to choke our potential for economic growth by squandering our precious resources with big highways and parking lots. Thanks, but no thanks. We'll build the most trains in the world. Uh, High-speed trains, beautiful trains that go everywhere all the time um, for affordable costs. But then uh, the auto industry of Japan was a big part of the U.S. war effort in Korea. They built all the jeeps and tanks for the Korean War. And then when the Korean War ended, Japan said, "Wait a minute! Our this important industry is going to collapse. What are we going to do?" And they said, let's do what the Americans do. Let's do this financial aid thing. Let's offer start, let's offer our country a highway system. We'll pay for it with loans. We'll give them expertise and they will build a highway system and we'll sell them cars. And they said, well, where should we do that? And they said, Thailand. And so Thailand became the test case for Japanese foreign aid and it filled uh, Bangkok with freeways and then Toyota built plants in Thailand and the government of Thailand promoted the idea that you too can have ultimate freedom of the road 
you can get go wherever you want, whenever you want, with your own car. And so the government of Thailand sent the message. Basically, this is a long way of saying the social media of Thailand has and continues to be, let's be more like Americans. Yes. Oh, I was going to say, uh, I think that Really obsessed with like that, especially in the government, or like that. And who else likes that? Americans. Americans. Who else? Anyone else? The world. Everybody else. This is week. This is week nine. We're gonna dive into this topic in week nine, and this. This is a. In a way, it's a terrifying story, right? It sounds depressing, right? They're doing exactly what we did, even though we knew better. Some of us were in Asia telling them every chance we get, please don't do what we did, but they did it anyway. Um, and they did it bigger, better, faster than us. When fortunately, capital, and here's a positive thing about capitalism, when the Japanese were done destroying participating in the destruction of the Thailand. They participated, they still want money. And so they said, oh, look, you had this horrible traffic jam problem in the 90s. And Japan said, what you need is heavy rail, right? And so they, again, they used the same model. We'll give you huge loans and we'll bring in experts and we'll give you what's it called, the sky, SkyTrain throughout Bangkok and problem solved, you're welcome. And so capitalism, and this is the most hopeful thing in this course, and I hope I'm not giving away the punchline. Capitalism can be the most destructive force on the planet, has been the most destructive force on the planet. But if you're, if you're driven by the profit motive, you don't care how many people you kill, how many planets you desecrate. You don't care what the consequences are. You're a machine. You're going after the money like a shark. So much so that a capitalist will, will do what they do, whatever it takes to make money, even if it fixes the problem. So the Japanese uh, corporations sought money by creating traffic jams in, in Bangkok and then the rest of the world because there it's everywhere throughout Latin America and Africa and now China's taking over that role. But they will also do what it takes to save the world if you rewrite the rules. You can write the rules that says, and this is the punchline of this. And this is what architects do. And capitalism does this. Um, I'm trying to save some time here. So capitalism is a giant feedback loop system. And it says, right now, what the rules say is whoever pulls the most resources out of the ground and dumps the most garbage into the air, water, and, and back into the ground. And whoever uh, uh, abuses child labor, et cetera, slavery, all of these things, whoever does the worst things humanly possible gets the most money. 
that's the rule. We put some guardrails up. We said, and eh, if it's overt, formalized, explicit slavery, you can't do that. You can't do that anymore. But you can have capitalist systems that force uh, you take the passport of the worker and they can't leave the country without you giving them the passport back. So uh, that's how Middle Eastern cities are built. That's how Zaha Hadid's architecture gets built is through, it's, it's a kind of forced labor. It's very close to slavery. Whoever does that the most gets the most money. And those, that's just the system, that's just the system we're in. If you want a different outcome, change the incentive system, change the rules. It, you know, we'll do this exercise where we'll elect someone from this classroom. So start thinking about it now. Who would be the best president of Exxon? Okay. We'll, we'll choose the most moral, the, the smartest, most uh, most generous, the one most committed to saving the planet from the perils of petrochemicals. You elect them to be president and we make them president. And then we ask them how that's how that's going. So think about who you would elect. But it doesn't matter. But the punchline is it doesn't matter who the person is. It's the rules of the game. If you want to change the outcomes of the system, change the rules of the game. Uh, that's what architects do. This is the key diagram to the way we now teach history theory too, since you guys took it, I think. Um, it's also the key diagram for the thesis program. <clears throat> the design projects that we come up with, it used to, it used to look like this. That the culture of the place you're working in is what sets up the systems, the economic systems, the political systems, the educational systems, the professional accreditation, how do you get a license? All the systems are built based on the cultural norms and values of the United States. And we can use that as a case. And then the system doesn't just automatically work on its own. We need to expand and reproduce that system by building cities and buildings and infrastructures that help the system grow and expand. And so when I went to school back in the last century, we knew with absolute certainty that cultures dictate systems and the systems dictate the projects. And the architects have no power. The architects are powerless. The architects just do what the clients ask them to do. No, it's, it's not our job, right? We just do. But that didn't work out so well. So increasingly, and in your educational experience, this is at the core of it, and in the in the this thesis program, I, I defy you to find a thesis project in the next coming years that isn't doing this. What we do as architects is we identify projects that, I, that take advantage of opportunities to rewrite that equation. We design possibilities that actually set up new systems, that set up new rules. Something that is uh, carbon neg negative, net negative, doesn't have to cost more. It can cost less. There's an example. Things that uh, uh, push back against racism and promote reparations can actually emerge out of the current uh, situation in Boston, it can actually help to, to improve housing affordability. People can take triple deckers and revise them and change the rules around triple deckers in ways that makes it legal in a way it's not legal now. You can't build a triple decker because it, it takes up too much of the parcel 
there's not enough parking. So we can rewrite the parking requirements, we rewrite condo law, rewrite property easements, et cetera, to make housing affordability not just attainable in a way that nobody thought possible until this project came along. So the projects we see coming out of this school are game changers, literally. They change the rules of the game and that can support system change and cultural evolution away from some of the fear-driven uh, cultural manifestations that we have too much of. And that's the cause of the big thing. I sometimes refer to the thing, that's climate, the climate emergency is the thing. So architects, but, but architects can do what we've always done. We can do what the client needs and we can improve the situation ever so slightly, but not in a way that creates a system change. This is an example we use in History 32. I write at the beginning, the slave ship uh, was very inhumane and it, it also, decrease the economic value of the cargo because too many enslaved humans were kidnapped and then died during the crossing. Uh, and it made people feel bad and it was a loss of value. So they called in the architects and they created new norms of slave ships. And so uh, the architects helped produce a better slave ship. That's an example of architects who are trapped in the system, the client is saying, I, we need this design and the architect produces the design and we're making better slave ships in that economic and political arrangement. That translates almost scarily directly to today when uh, the biggest architecture firm in the country, ACOM, Maybe some of you know it, maybe some of you uh, worked for ACOM during your co-op. They are fine building prisons. They are fine building prisons with solitary confinement. This became an issue that the AIA, what is that similar? American Institute of Architects, I think. Not the Architect Institute of America. Um, so the, the American Institute of Architects had meetings and they came up with an ethical uh, rule. They say, thou shalt not design for solitary confinement. And it's now part of the ethical obligations of the architectural profession. And so we pushed back and that's part of our system change. We don't make, friends don't let friends make uh, design better slave ships. Friends don't let friends and Professional organizations do not allow its members to design better solitary confinement cells. Sure, you can make it slightly more humane, but we're now in the business of system change. It's the 21st century. We need to do something different than what we did. <clears throat> so, the lecture that you don't remember from History 32 went through a series of examples where the design of the built environment, the design of buildings, the design of cities demonstrated system change. There's more examples uh, and we're looking for those examples between now and Tuesday. So we talked about the Netherlands very quickly the Netherlands is called the Netherlands because it's below, at or below sea level. It's nether, it's very low, the lowlands. And they got flooded and a lot of people died starting in the ninth century and then multiple times throughout its history. So what did they do? They redesigned the landscape as a system of dikes and, uh, and uh, windmills to protect the lands, the, population from flooding, but it was tricky. If you had 12 people in your village, they would have, they would have uh, parts of the wall. So the flood wall was only as good as its weakest link. If no one 
took care of their, if no one built a dike, uh, they would all get flooded. If 11 people built their dike and one person didn't, they would all get flooded. Same outcome. You have to get 12 people working together in concert in order for it to have any significance at all. So the Dutch are famous for consensus, consent, political systems. They are all members of water boards locally and regionally. These are all water boards. And uh, so their political system was based on the design of the landscape based on disaster. This is a, one of the cases where disaster can teach us how to do better things. The next example is a counter example is the Ogallala Aquifer, uh, one of the largest freshwater aquifers in the world. And it's being depleted very quickly uh, for growing soybeans and cattle feed. And there are government programs that incentivize using these types of agricultural. At the center of each one of these is a, a well and pump. And as we pump down the water of the Adalala Aquifer, uh, they have to drill, they have to redrill each of these wells deeper and deeper every year. And so you would think they would make uh, an input output relationship that would um, incentivize uh, conservation, but it's the opposite. If you don't pump water, you lose your water rights. So there are some farmers who dig their wells deeper, they pump water and they just let it gush on the ground to evaporate in order to retain their water rights so they can sell those water rights in the future. So because of the economics of investment, this is a backwards incentive system. At some point, we'll talk about the tragedy of the commons where uh, shared resources uh, and this is the model of the rules of capitalism. If you prevent these three uh, sheep herders from talking to each other, then each one of them is going to tr try to raise as many sheep as they can on this limited piece of shared grazing land. And it's going to destroy it. It's going to become a muddy hole and no one's going to be able to raise any sheep. That's the tragedy of the commons that we don't have time. But there's also the triumph of the commons, where if people do talk to each other, if you do set up the rules and incentive systems properly, if you create attractive design practices, if you design elements into the system that encourage cooperation, you can actually make it profitable to do the right thing. And this is an economics of of uh, resource conservation and designing for a world that actually survives the next uh, century. Singapore, another example of, of disaster. Singapore uh, did not earn independence from Malaysia. Singapore was ejected from Malaysia because uh, there was a lot of uh, anti-Chinese racism. There was fear of communist party politics. And the poverty and uh, deprivation of the slums of Singapore made it a big problem. It was a city that was determined to be too far gone. Singapore was too far gone in 1965. Malaysia ejected it from the country. And Lee Kuan Yew, the senator representing Singapore, went on TV, announced it, and burst into tears on TV. So out of that disaster, they developed a land use transportation arrangement. They changed uh, this, they exchanged slums for high rise modern housing slabs, like the ones we hate in the United States. I'm pointing out the window. We hate them, right? But in Singapore, 85% of the population, Singapore's, what were your associations with Singapore? It's a success, right? Some of the most bizarre flamboyant architecture in the world is in Singapore, right? So a huge success. 
they did it by not by promoting automobile ownership. They actually have been a model for controlling without outlawing it outright. They control uh, automobile usage, not ownership, uh, through economic rules. And they created housing, high quality modern housing and uh, linked to transportation. And now also I'm pointing out the window, that's what we do here. We do what they did in Singapore in 1965. That's what Northeastern has done at Ruggles Station. It's right there. Maybe we'll take a field trip one day. And by linking uh, transportation and housing the way we are starting to do in the United States, uh, they actually became the favorite place to have highly educated workers with low housing costs, low transportation costs, so you can pay them less and get more done for less money. It became the, the darling of capitalist uh, production. And look at the architecture. Crazy. Have you been? We're not going to take a field trip to Singapore. I'm sorry. Dubai, we have taken we have taken field trips to Dubai. I've taken students to Dubai. Crazy, but um, Bilbao, we are taking students to Bilbao in the fall. Seniors. Okay, this is the part that you're probably most, if I were you, I'd be most interested in because one of the questions that should be up here is on the most pragmatic level, how do I succeed in this case? How much, this is a four credit course. How much time is a four credit course supposed to take outside of class? Have you done this with any of your other classes? Your answer is no time, as little as possible on a good day, right? What's your answer? How, okay, how much time should this class take outside of the class? Let's show, show up hands. Zero time. Um, one hour a week. Two to four hours a week. Four to six hours a week. six to eight hours a week, more than eight hours a week outside of class. Okay, no one wants that. Believe it or not, the, the organization that controls the standards for credit hours in a class, have you, do, you, do you know about this? The Carnegie uh, Institute something, higher education standards. They say for a four credit class, you spend four hours a week in class, and you spend three times that outside of class. What's four times three? 12, that's insane. No one wants you to spend 12 hours outside of class, right? The, the norm at Wentworth is that uh, you will spend something like six to eight hours outside of class. That's the Wentworth norm. And for studio, it sounds crazy, but it's a six credit class, so it's 12 hours outside of class a week. But actually, if you spend 12, if you spend 12 productive hours outside of class a week uh, in studio doing focused work, that's pretty good, yeah. Right. No, because it's a six credit course. But those studio contact hours are considered lab hours because it's not this intense, right? You're doing desk crits. So it's a six credit class, 12 hours in class, 12 hours outside of class. Think about that. I don't know if that's where you guys are doing it. But by that same standard, this class is four to eight hours 
outside of class to get, and that if you're spending four to eight hours outside of class, if you're spending eight hours outside of class, and you're doing what the assignment says, you're reading the instructions, and you're actually focusing and doing the things that it says without going off on tangents, you should expect to get an A in this class. If you're not, if you're spending that much time and you're reading the instructions and you're asking questions and you're not getting an A, there's something wrong with the system and we need to talk. That said, this assignment, this analysis assignment is uh, two things about this analysis assignment. It's difficult, uh, but it's the same assignment every week, more or less. It's time consuming, it's new to you, it's demanding, it's difficult, but uh, you get to do it 11, no, yeah, 12 times. You get to do it 12 times. Are you going to do it perfectly the first time? Are you going to be able to do it in four hours the first time? No. You're going to spend more time this week doing it and doing less well than you are going to uh, later in the semester. So the secret to success in this class is read these instructions carefully. I know that's hard. It's like four pages with the example. The instructions are really just two pages or one and a half pages. There's a lot of moving parts, uh, but in Brightspace, there are specific guidelines. You don't have to do all of the moving parts the first week. What we really want you to do is to choose a project and an image of that project. We want you to use Photoshop to color it in a way that reveals, that explores how the art picture is doing what it's doing. And then we want you to write five sentences that comes directly out of what you're observing in the photograph. Yes. Uh, when do you want it to? When would you prefer it to be due? I don't know. Do, do you want to have this project due 8 a.m. on Tuesday? Yes. Anyone object to having it due 8 a.m. on Tuesday? Any objections there? And I want to point out, and not everyone knows this, you are allowed to start doing the work more than two hours before the deadline. Shocker. That is okay. We do not punish you. Right? You could do it today and turn it in. Yes. Is it what? This is individual so far. So let's look at some examples. So this is, well, this is what we're interested in. Talking about disaster and what it can teach us. Wow, my eyes were opened in 2004. In 2004, I, no, 2006, I came to teach here and I met a name named Manuel Delgado and he changed my life. In 2007, I saw a magazine article in the New York Times about a city called Medellin, Colombia. Have you heard of it? Have you heard of cocaine? <laughs> Have you heard of Pablo Escobar? Have you heard of Narcos? Have you seen Narcos? Okay. The most dangerous in the place in the world today is Carabobo, Mexico. I don't have the updated thing on the slide. And Caracas, Venezuela, the two most dangerous cities in the world today. The murder rate per 100,000 people uh, this past year is like 110 per 100,000. In Medellin, Colombia, in 1994, the murder rate was 391 
some about four times as high. It was the most death, the most, the highest murder rate in human history ever recorded. It doesn't matter, wars, famines, black plague, highest death rate ever. So um, our friend, friend of Manuel's, friend of the departments, Sergio Fajardo, mathematician, said, this is no good. His father was an architect. He ran for, ran for mayor. He had a radio show. Instead of having bodyguards guards and armored vehicles, he walked from neighborhood to neighborhood. He won in a landslide and he brought together his team of architects and he said, okay, people, we've got, we've promised <clears throat> to stop stealing money from the people. We've got to deliver on the promise, not just by filling the, the bank account of the municipal, uh, the municipality, we have to build infrastructure that helps the people, that changes. So they looked at where the bodies were piling up and they said, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna help the people who were most devastated by the crime violence. And so they chose this place where Escobar was in the habit of dumping bodies. And they built the library. Uh, they built a beautiful library park, which is much more than a library, much more than a park. It, it was a machine for helping people's lives. They asked the people, what do you need? They, they said, do you want new houses? And they said, no, 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 no. Our houses are fine, thank you very much. What we need is we need a connection to the city so we can join life there. We need places for our children that can, that can be safe. And <clears throat> so they built a library park, world-class architecture for the most desperate neighborhoods in the city. Then they did it four more times. And then they did it 25 more times. Fast forward, I took my family, we lived there in 2014. Sergio Fajardo came to Wentworth, he told us all about it as soon as he left office. So we want you to look up these projects. We want you to take pictures like this. We, want, we don't want you to fly there and find a helicopter. We want you to find oblique aerial photographs with human scale experience in the foreground so we can understand how humans engage this architecture and the larger urban context in the background. And we want you to use colored, transparent, highly transparent colored forms to draw our attention to the circulation paths, to the housing, to the relate, so we can understand the relationship between the architecture and the larger urban system around it. How does this architecture, how is it a game changer? How does this project change the larger system and culture of this situation? More examples. Do you have ISIS um, on the space? Yes. My favorite library park is La Quintana. Here's the library park. Here's the neighborhood. They're not separated. There's a connection right there. So much stuff. No, the read, there's no reading to read at this point. The next, the first reading you're engaged, you're going to engage is after Tuesday before Thursday. So we're just trying to read online on our own. You find these online on your own, and then you use Photoshop. And on Brightspace, it's very clear. It says all the things that are in the assignment. The ones you do is number one, you select an image. You're number two, you use Photoshop to analyze. 
And then do number three, <laughs> first part of number three. And that's it. You don't have to write a claim. You don't have to write a question. You don't have to record a video animation. You don't have to write a caption. You don't have to write a footnote. That all comes later. Just choose an image, color it with Photoshop, and then write five sentences. The five sentences should be should start with the clearest, most powerful thing that comes out. And, that, and then you should, each one of the sentences should be translation of what you can discover in the image and translate that into words, just like history theory too. Okay. Sorry that it took so long, but it was good, right? It's gonna be a fun adventure. We'll make it fun. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Yes. Does the photograph be found?